I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Thorpe. He is a professor of neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and director of the Sleep Wake Disorder Center at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. Dr. Thorpe is a clinician who treats patients with sleep disorders. He also conducts research in sleep. Welcome, Dr. Thorpe. Good, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here back at a uh, Narcolepsy Network meeting again. It's, uh, it's great that so many people are, are attending these meetings. I think they're extremely valuable for the families and the patients who have narcolepsy. So it's great that you're here. Okay, I, I was uh, asked to um, give a, uh, an overview of narcolepsy, a sort of a, a narcolepsy 101 or as the title says, back to basics, because there are some of you who are new to narcolepsy, and uh, also to sort of bring uh, those of you who are not new to it sort of up to date with uh, uh, our understanding and how we think about narcolepsy. So this is a, a, a brief uh, overview of uh, the uh, symptomatology, the uh, diagnosis, uh, what causes it, the pathophysiology, and the treatment of uh, narcolepsy. Okay, so, um, okay, I guess I got it down here. Okay, these are my disclosures. I, I'm a consultant to most of the companies that are producing medications for the treatment of uh, narcolepsy or hypersomnias. Okay, so narcolepsy, um, so it's a, uh, I like to think of narcolepsy as being a disorder that has three main features to it. Uh, gets a little complicated, the five, is it four, is it five, is it six, uh, if you talk about the pentad or quadrad or whatever. So, but anyway, there's three main features of narcolepsy. One is the tiredness and sleepiness, the excessive daytime sleepiness. The second is abnormal REM sleep phenomena. And then the third is a disturbed nocturnal sleep. So those are the three main features of uh, narcolepsy. Now, in terms of the excessive daytime sleepiness, it's not just falling asleep at times when you don't want to. But there's more to it than that. And I like to think of it as being the sleepiness composed of four different features. So that there's this background level of tiredness, fatigue, sleepiness that's there all the time, or brain fog never sort of clears and it's in the background all the time. But on top of that, people may get times that they're very sleepy and take a voluntary sleep ep uh, episode, so take a nap, or they may have involuntary ones, trying to do something, you know, write something or watch something on TV and then uh, involuntarily will fall asleep, or so-called sleep attacks. And then there's this fourth component, which uh, I often call wakeful sleepiness, because patients are seeming to be uh, seemingly awake, but they're having little micro-sleep episodes that last one or two seconds in duration. But those micro-sleep episodes don't inhibit the person from doing what they're doing, whether they're driving a car or uh, walking down the street. But it does tend to blot out memory formation. And people have these episodes that we call automatic behavior, where they do things and uh, they may drive somewhere. And then when they get to where they're going, they don't remember crossing the bridge because that part's sort of blotted out, even though they're able to drive perfectly well. So I, I think of sleepiness as being these four different features. And now in terms of the REM sleep phenomena, cataplexy of course is the one that we're all familiar with and it's the most uh, uh, predominant symptom in narcolepsy. But it's one of many other uh, abnormal REM features. There's the sleep paralysis. Dr. Manuel Menno mentioned that this morning where patients will have some uh, weakness that occurs. Uh, in narcolepsy, it's most common upon awakening in the morning. It's most specific for it. Uh, but uh, if they have it when they're falling asleep at night, it's more actually diagnostic for narcolepsy because it's associated with disrupted REM sleep. So it's the atonia of REM sleep. And you're not supposed to have REM sleep at the beginning of the night. So if you have sleep paralysis at the beginning of the night, then it's more indicative of narcolepsy. Uh, patients can have very vivid dreams. So uh, as you, you're probably all aware, dreams tend to be very vivid, long. Uh, they may be bizarre dreams. They may be very frightening dreams. But that 
occur more commonly than they do in uh, uh, non-narcolepsy populations. And then there's uh, abnormal um, REM sleep behavior that can occur uh, where people will tend to have some activity during the REM sleep. So REM sleep is, the dreaming sleep's disrupted, so they'll have actual movement activity uh, that occur at that time. And then when we talk about the hallucinations, uh, we, I like to call them sleep-related hallucinations. Uh, they's, that's both um, hallucinations that can occur as somebody's falling asleep or as they're waking up in the morning. So again, the ones that occur as the patient's falling asleep are more sort of diagnostic for narcolepsy because again, you shouldn't be dreaming as you're falling asleep at night. Uh, many people, uh, normal people, will wake up in the morning out of REM sleep and they may have some sleep paralysis or some uh, hallucinatory behavior. And so it's less diagnostic, but it does tend to occur more commonly in patients with narcolepsy, either at the beginning of sleep or on awakening from sleep. <clears throat> so those are the abnormal REM phenomena. And as I mentioned, the, the most important one really is cataplexy, this emotionally induced muscle weakness and as Dr. Amino mentioned this morning, it's mainly positive emotions, you know, happiness, laughter, excitement, those sorts of things that tend to bring it on. And then uh, typically uh, the patients don't just suddenly collapse to the ground, as he, he mentioned. So uh, most patients don't tend to injure themselves, although patients can injure themselves if they fall to the ground suddenly. Uh, so that can happen, but generally it's a sinking feeling. Uh, as Dr. Kran mentioned to me when uh, Emmanuel talked about that, she said it's really a melting uh, of the patient in a way it is, it's sort of like a melting feeling. And uh, it can be um, generalized and most often we're aware of uh, patients falling to the ground, but most patients don't tend to have many of those episodes where they fall to the ground, but they have uh, localized episodes. So it may be just related to the head and neck. It may be a drooping of the eyes, a drooping of the head. Uh, it, it may be a slurring of the voice as the person's talking and they get a little bit of cataplexy. They may be holding something and drop something. I find that patients with narcolepsy tend to regard themselves as a little bit more clumsy than other people. And it's partly because if they get a little bit of weakness, if they're thinking about something emotional, they may catch their toe and stumble or they may uh, drop something that they're holding. So uh, uh, it can be uh, localized to the upper part of the body or the arms, uh, uh, and it's not always associated with buckling of the knees and falling to the ground. Now, cataplexy generally doesn't occur at the very onset of narcolepsy. It can. It can be the first symptom that patients are aware of before they even appreciate the fact of the sleepiness. But in most cases, the sleepiness begins first. And what this slide shows is that the cataplexy can occur many months later. And you can see here uh, over 20 months later um, uh, yeah. uh, that uh, cataplexy can occur. So it, it um, develops over time. Typically, cataplexy occurs within the first six months of the onset of sleepiness, but uh, it may occur very much later. And so many people may find that they think, well, I don't really have narcolepsy or I don't have the type one narcolepsy because I don't have cataplexy, but then it, then it develops. And it's sort of a little strange that you change one diagnostic category to another for a symptom that sort of develops uh, uh, at a later time. I mean, the disease process is still the same from the beginning. Now, this is uh, a 1,000 patients that we looked at who had narcolepsy. And what you see here in the light blue is the age of onset of narcolepsy. Now, the median age of onset in this sample of 1,000 patients was 16 years. The, in red is the time of diagnosis. The median age of diagnosis was 33. Now, you can see if you uh, look at this, uh, let me see, this is so oh, good. Uh, you can see here how few, uh, although it's happening in the first decade of life, how few patients are actually getting diagnosed. And although narcolepsy is really a childhood disorder, although it can occur at any age, but most cases tend to occur in childhood, but it doesn't get diagnosed until people become adults. 
it's getting better because more people are aware of it. Pediatricians are more aware of narcolepsy. So uh, the diagnosis, the time between the onset of symptoms and the time to diagnosis is getting a lot shorter. But it's still not as rapid as we would like to see it. There's still many patients who uh, spend many months trying to get a diagnosis before they get diagnosed. But you can see, um, if we can go back here, uh, see here that it, uh, the onset can occur at any age, even into elderly, and it can occur even in very young uh, children, even infants, it's been reported. In. Okay, so there is a, a pediatric narcolepsy. When the narcolepsy occurs in childhood, it is a bit different from the adult form of narcolepsy. Now, Dr. Maskey is going to be talking about this later, so she'll go into much greater detail, but some of the things that are different are the sleepiness, Children often have this hyperactivity associated with their sleepiness, whereas we don't typically see that in, in adults. Uh, so um, uh, there may be a lot of um, emotional uh, sort of dysregulation around this uh, hyperactivity that occur in children. And then with the cataplexy, uh, children can often have hyperkinetic movements, which means increased movements. Typically in adults, they will get the weakness that occurs with the cataplexy. So they'll get the flattening of the face, the uh, weakness of the legs. But children can often have a lot of increased movement activity. They can have, oops, facial grimacing, uh, and um, uh, there may be what's called tongue protrusion. They'll tend to stick their tongue into their cheek or, or even out of their mouth. And uh, often their movements are sort of discoordinated movements, and people often refer to them as puppet-like movements in children. So it's a little different in children, the cataplexy and the sleepiness, but then it changes to the adult form as the child gets older. Okay, uh, now the other thing I mentioned, so there's uh, three things of narcolepsy, the excessive daytime sleepiness, the abnormal REM phenomena, and then there's a disturbed nocturnal sleep. And people often complain about this and mention it either that they're unable to sleep without awakening and they may awaken numerous times at night. Uh, they may get up and eat at night, which is a relatively common uh, symptom associated with narcolepsy. And then they may be waking up too early in the morning. Typically, patients with narcolepsy will fall asleep quickly. So uh, it's different from insomnia. People say, well, is it this insomnia in a patient with narcolepsy? No, it's not insomnia. People with insomnia have trouble falling asleep. Patients with narcolepsy don't. They can fall asleep in most cases, but they tend to awaken up as the night goes on. So that makes it different from, from what we see in insomnia. Now, <clears throat> in terms of a diagnosis, the main form of diagnosis, as I'm sure you are all aware, uh, having gone through it, is the multiple sleep latency test, this daytime test. And this uh, tells us about the severity of the sleepiness, but also tells us about the abnormal REM sleep phenomena, so that patients may go into REM sleep during the day. And that's what we're looking for. So we have the patient have five 20 minute nap opportunities. Sometimes it may be shortened to four naps. If somebody has sleep onset REM periods on, uh, within the first four naps, two or more, then uh, the, the uh, physicians may terminate the study at that time. It has to follow an all-night polysomnogram. You can't do it separately. There is another test called the maintenance of wakefulness test where we ask a patient to stay awake. That can be done without a preceding night sleep study. But for the MSLT, you have to have a preceding night sleep study. And patients are reclining in a darkened room and asked to relax and if they want to, to fall asleep. And we look and see if they fall asleep on average over those naps within eight minutes. Uh, and if they go into the REM sleep on two or more occasions. And if they do, then that's diagnostic of narcolepsy. So this is the, the main diagnostic test uh, for narcolepsy. And it does follow that all-night polysomnogram. And we do the all-night polysomnogram to make sure that the patient's having an adequate amount of sleep at night. I mean, if somebody comes in and they're sleep-deprived, they get less than six hours of sleep, then they may have sleep onset REM periods during the day. So we need to ensure that they've got adequate sleep at night and that then they, uh, we look during the MSLT to see if they're sleepy. But on the nighttime sleep study, they may fall asleep quickly. They may go into REM sleep 
uh, within 15 minutes of sleep onset REM period. And that by itself can be diagnostic for narcolepsy. But only 50% of patients with narcolepsy will do that. So uh, go into the REM sleep within 15 minutes at night. Generally, they have uh, l increased amount of light sleep. And uh, the amount of time that they spend to sleep for the amount of time in bed is reduced in narcolepsy. So it's uh, usually less than 85% of the night. Now, the uh, nighttime sleep study tells us a, a lot more. Not only does it help us in diagnosing narcolepsy, but it helps us exclude other disorders as well. So typically we see a lot of features on the nighttime sleep study that the astute clinician can use to help him diagnose if a patient has narcolepsy. If the patient has a, uh, a false negative, they don't get the sleep onset REM periods or they don't fall asleep in less than eight minutes on the MSLT. There's other information the physician can get from the nighttime sleep study that can tell them that that patient could well have narcolepsy. Now obviously if they fall asleep quickly, if they go into that REM sleep very quickly, the reduced sleep efficiency, if the uh, sleep efficiency, the amount of time they spend asleep in bed for the amount of time they're in bed is high, that indicates sleep deprivation, not narcolepsy. Uh, typically patients with narcolepsy will have frequent awakenings, increased number of arousals. Again, somebody who's sleep deprived, you're gonna have less of those. Uh, they will have uh, REM sleep fragmentation, a narcolepsy patient, whereas it may be more cohesive episodes in someone without it. Uh, the lighter stage of sleep is increased, and this is often because it's partial elements of the REM sleep. If you get a little bit of REM sleep without the rapid eye movements, you score it as uh, you call it stage one sleep. So patients with narcolepsy tend to have higher stage one. So that can help in the diagnosis. They may have uh, reduced slow wave sleep, and uh, the total sleep time may be a little reduced too. But it has to be more than six hours to in correctly interpret the uh, multiple sleep latency test. Now in terms of a diagnostic criteria, as you're aware we have two types of narcolepsy, narcolepsy type 1. For most cases the patients will have cataplexy. Not every case, there are rare cases where the, uh, the measurement of hypocretin in the spinal fluid is low that the patient doesn't have cataplexy. But that's unusual. Most cases are going to have cataplexy, so type 1 is really narcolepsy with cataplexy. The diagnostic criteria says at least three months of sleepiness, but you can really diagnose narcolepsy before three months. So someone's very sleepy and they have uh, cataplectic episodes or, you know, at the time of onset, you can make the diagnosis without getting that three months of sleepiness. But to be sure, you want three months of continuous sleepiness to be sure that the patient has a chronic uh, hypersomnia disorder. And then uh, for the type 1, then they're going to have cataplexy and they must have those features on that MSLT. Or if you don't have that, you could just measure that CSF hypocretin that Dr. Amino was talking about and show that it's low. And that uh, uh, can give a diagnosis of narcolepsy as well. Uh, <clears throat> Now for the type 2, these are the patients that don't have cataplexy. And uh, you again have that three months of sleepiness, you have the same features on that multiple sleep latency test, so they still have the sleep onset REM periods, so they have the abnormal REM sleep phenomena in the type 2, but they don't have cataplexy. And if you were to measure that CSF hypocretin, it would be normal if it was measured. In most cases it's not measured. Uh, you know, very few people do measure CSF hypocretin. It's certainly it's done for research studies. Europeans tend to do it more commonly. Um, American patients tend not to want to have a spinal tap as easily as Europeans do, so uh, it's done less commonly here. And now there's another set of diagnostic criteria, and this is from the American Psychiatric Association, and some of you may have been diagnosed according to these criteria. And uh, again, they, they uh, say you have narcolepsy if you have three months of sleepiness. And if you have cataplexy, uh, without having to have an MSLT, you have uh, narcolepsy. Uh, or you could have the hypocretin deficiency. Or you could have that sleep onset REM period on the nighttime sleep study. So if you don't have a daytime MSLT, but you have an overnight sleep study and it shows you're going to REM sleep within 15 minutes, that coupled with three months of sleepiness is enough to diagnose narcolepsy. 
or alternatively, uh, you can have the uh, multiple sleep latency test as uh, in um, the uh, other criteria. Okay, then we have this condition, idiopathic hypersomnia, and some of you may be diagnosed with this. Um, it's a, uh, we're getting more information on idiopathic hypersomnia. There are more studies being done, so we're learning a lot more about it. But these are patients who are sleepy. They can be just as sleepy as a patient with narcolepsy. They don't have cataplexy. If you were to do that multiple sleep latency test, they don't go into REM sleep. So, so they have the sleepiness, but they don't have the abnormal REM sleep phenomena as much as patients who have narcolepsy. They may actually have sleep paralysis, they may have vivid dreams, they may have some uh, sleep-related hallucinations, uh, but they don't uh, have the sleep onset REM periods on the daytime MSLT. Uh, but uh, if you were to do a, a multiple sleep latency test, you would find that uh, they um, have um, a mean sleep latency of less than eight minutes, uh, which sort of confirms the diagnosis, so long as you exclude other causes of the sleepiness. Or some of these patients, and it looks like it's a subgroup of patients, have very long sleep within a 24-hour period. They may actually have 12 to 14 hours of sleep within a day and have great difficulty waking in the morning. That seems like a, a subtype of idiopathic hypersomnia. The other type looks more like the patient with narcolepsy, but they don't have the, those REM onsets on the MSLT. So uh, uh, either way, you can diagnose uh, idiopathic hypersomnia. Now, some people uh, like to think of narcolepsy as being a sort of a spectrum disorder. At one end, we have the type 1 narcolepsy, so that we have the patient who has the cataplexy and they may have a low CSF hypocretin level. At the other end, we have idiopathic hypersomnia where they may have long sleep time and uh, uh, the hypocretin level is generally normal in those patients. They may have uh, a lot of sleep inertia. And then, as you can see, there are overlaps between these three different disorders and NT2 sort of falling here sort of in the middle. So some people think of it as a, a spectrum disorder. And there is a little bit of evidence that uh, one can transition from one type of uh, this, these disorders to the other. Generally, it's in the direction of going from idiopathic hypersomnia to NT1. If you've got NT1, you don't go back. So you don't, go, uh, you don't suddenly become an NT2 or an idiopathic hypersomnia patient. But it's really, some patients initially diagnosed as having idiopathic hypersomnia then may develop REM onsets and get a diagnosis of NT2, and then subsequently may develop cataplexy and become NT1. So you can go that way. Some of these patients also tend to resolve, and same with the NT2 patients. Their condition resolves. That never happens with the uh, type 1 narcolepsy. So there's some variability in sort of... Uh, uh, differences between these disorders, but there may be a flow here, and that's why this term narcolepsy spectrum disorder has, has been applied. Now, Dr. Mino talked a lot about hypocretins, but uh, as you're aware, it's a neuropeptide. It's, it's not a chemical like uh, dopamine or, or uh, acetylcholine, etc. It's a peptide, it's a protein, and it's produced in the hypothalamus, and these uh, hypocretin cells tend to stimulate all the other wake-promoting cells throughout the brain. And uh, this, uh, I think Dr. Mino showed you, that patients with narcolepsy tend to have absent hypocretin oops, in the CSF. Uh, and if you looked at the brain in a patient with type 1 narcolepsy, you would find that they don't have the erexin cells in the hypothalamus whereas normal controls have lots of these cells. So it's a complete destruction and elimination of the uh, hypocretin cells. And the cause of it uh, uh, may be by an infection. Uh, again, Dr. Bino mentioned today about uh, the virus, uh, the influenza virus in China. There's a lot of good data showing that that caused an increase in narcolepsy. The H1N1 vaccine, particularly in Europe, was a cause of it. And there have been associations with other types of infective agents. So our current feeling is that it's an infection that precipitates this, uh, even though the patient may not aware of, be aware of having, been infect, uh, having an infection. 
The HLA, uh, again, uh, Dr. Mino mentioned this, uh, the HLA DQB10602, present in uh, over 90% of patients with NT1 uh, narcolepsy. Dr. Mino mentioned the figure 98%, so a very high percentage. Not absolutely everybody has uh, this HLA DQB10602, but certainly the majority of type 1 narcolepsy patients are positive for that. And uh, if you are positive for that, then pretty typically, if you have uh, cataplexy, you're going to have low CSF hypocretin, if it was to be measured. Now, narcolepsy is often uh, misdiagnosed, and uh, it's misdiagnosed because uh, of other conditions. Uh, depressive disorders are very common, uh, anxiety disorders. I'm going to go uh, fairly quickly here, because I'm sort of getting uh, uh, out of time here. Also, I'd like to mention that there are a lot of other conditions that can occur. Somebody mentioned uh, central sleep apnea. It is reported in uh, narcolepsy, and obstructive sleep apnea occurs more commonly. And REM sleep behavior disorder, sleep walking, sleep talking, uh, increase in body weight, particularly in the children, we see that. Precocious puberty can occur in children. And there's more interest these days in uh, cardiovascular disorders, and there's an increased incidence of hypertension. So uh, these are the comorbidities, these are the conditions that can occur in association with narcolepsy. So in summary then, uh, it's a disorder that occurs median onset age of onset of 16. It occurs about 1 in 2,000 uh, of the general population, narcolepsy type 1 and 2. Uh, most patients who uh, present with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness need to be considered as to whether they have narcolepsy. It's felt that about 50% are undiagnosed. And um, pathophysiology, as I mentioned, for the NT1, it's loss of that hypocretin. NT2, we still don't know, although it's possible that some of these patients have a, may have a more minor loss of uh, hypocretin. We don't know yet. And it's, treat, it's incurable, lifelong disorder and treated by medication. So it's an autoimmune disorder in people who have this HLA DQB10602 uh, precipitated by an infection causing loss of hypocretin cells. Okay, talking about treatment then. So the goal is to reduce daytime sleepiness, control those abnormal REM sleep phenomena, uh, treat the disturbed nocturnal sleep, to improve cognition, psychosocial, and work functioning, and also improve patient's function, uh, safety. We can do um, behavioral treatments, although generally these are not effective, but certainly avoiding sleep-inducing situations can be good. It's important that patients get a good amount of nocturnal sleep, at least eight hours, uh, avoid sedative medications. Uh, not ideal, but some patients will avoid emotional situations to prevent the cataplexy and, of course, need to make sure that they're in safe environments. In terms of the medications, uh, these are the uh, recent uh, Academy of Sleep Medicine practice parameters for narcolepsy, and they gave a strong recommendation for modafinil, sodium oxalate, patolicin, and solreamphetol. These recommendations said that these drugs work in narcolepsy, basically. That's what they were saying. And um, for uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, uh, they gave a strong recommendation for modafinil based on the evidence. But then this was before uh, low sodium oxalate or Zywave was approved for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. So when we come to treatment of patients with narcolepsy, there are many different medications and they have different uh, receptor types that they affect. Dr. Mino mentioned that this morning with regards to the dopamine receptors, uh, but some pathomimetic receptors, GABA B receptor, uh, there may be work, uh, combination uh, dopamine norepinephrine receptor uh, uptake inhibitors, and uh, histamine antagonists, H3 receptor antagonists that increase histamine. And then there are the uh, orexin or hypocretin agonists. So many different receptor types can improve the conditions. And what we do is we often combine drugs of different classes together to get the best type of treatment. 
So oxabate in general, uh, it's the only drug that treats all the symptoms of narcolepsy, treats those REM phenomena, the disturbed nighttime sleep and the daytime uh, sleepiness. There's this new form which has less sodium called Zywave or mixed salts oxabate uh, and uh, it's taken twice at night and uh, it's felt to be better for people that have renal disease, congestive heart failure or other cardiovascular disorders particularly. Um, and then uh, idiopathic hypersomnia I mentioned uh, was recently uh, got the approval, first drug approved for idiopathic hypersomnia which is this mixed salt soxabate uh, was approved. So reamphetol is a fairly new medication, it's a norepinephrine, a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor and it's approved for both the sleepiness of sleep apnea as well as narcolepsy. It's excreted in the urine, so it doesn't interfere with drugs that are metabolized in the liver. In particular, it doesn't interfere with oral contraceptives, so it has that uh, advantage, but doesn't treat cataplexy, only sleepiness. But we have the traditional stimulants, the methylphenidate and the amphetamines. And um, Dr. Crown mentioned this morning how uh, uh, they've been treating patients at the Mayo Clinic since 1922, and back in those days, they only had methylphenidate and uh, uh, and amphetamines initially back in 22, only uh, amphetamines, and then I th in about 1950s they got uh, methylphenidate. And uh, they looked, uh, a study they did looked at high dose stimulants in patients with narcolepsy and found a lot of problems with uh, psychosis, hospitalizations, cardiac uh, problems, etc. So there, there is a risk with the traditional stimulants because they produce whole body stimulation. And uh, there's recent evidence of new onset psychosis in people with uh, amphetamines. Then there's patolicent. I mentioned this is a drug that works through histamine. Uh, so it increases brain histamine. Um, it's uh, good because it works uh, taken once in the day in the morning and it can work throughout the day and treats both sleepiness and cataplexy. It does interfere with uh, oral contraceptives, so patients do need to take some other form of uh, contraception if they're using this, but has that advantage that it's a non-scheduled drug, so it makes it a lot easier to prescribe from that point of view. With regard to modafinil, recent uh, evidence came out that modafinil can affect uh, the fetus in pregnant women and can cause some fetal malformation. So definitely this is the one drug for narcolepsy that shouldn't be taken Modafinil or armodafinil should not be taken during pregnancy. Uh, so in treating, uh, uh, these are the medications used to treat cataplexy. Uh, Oxabate is, uh, is one and patolicent. Uh, those are the two main drugs FDA approved for cataplexy. Antidepressants can be used, but none of them are FDA approved. Generally, it tends to be what we call the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Effexor or venlafaxine, atomoxetine that are used. They, so the antidepressants can be effective in, uh, uh, for cataplexy, very, can be very effective, but they can cause sexual adverse effects, can reduce libido and uh, sexual function. They can disturb nocturnal sleep. They're not effective for the abnormal REM sleep phenomena. In some cases, they actually can precipitate the, that behavior at night. Not, of, uh, not effective for daytime sleepiness, and if you stop them suddenly, you run the risk of getting severe cataplexy. And as I mentioned, none of them are approved for uh, uh, narcolepsy. A lot of new drugs under investigation. And uh, again, so as a follow-up to the uh, uh, talk you just had about uh, uh, invest, uh, uh, clinical trials, we have so many new drugs coming out for narcolepsy and there are so many more that are about to undergo clinical trials. We desperately need patients in these studies. Uh, a number of the medications that are subsequently being approved have been delayed in their approval because they're having a longer time getting subjects into the studies. So the more I can encourage you to participate in studies, the quicker we're going to be able to get new medications for the treatment of narcolepsy. And uh, you can see here a list of a number of uh, different medications that are under investigation, and including erexin agonists at the present time. And these are just some of the companies that are uh, looking at uh, new medications that aren't doing clinical trials as yet, 
but uh, in the near future we'll start up doing clinical trials. So again, putting a big load on those companies that are already doing studies because they won't be able to get enough patients to do these studies for narcolepsy. So the more people that can get involved in research studies, the better. So in treatment then, uh, first line I, I believe is oxabate. It's the only drug that treats really all the symptoms of, uh, of narcolepsy. And uh, the alternative to that would be patolicent because that's the only other drug that's FDA approved for sleepiness and cataplexy. And then you have the uh, modafinil, solreamphetol. Uh, for cataplexy, you have off-label uh, antidepressants. And I, I, I believe the uh, uh, earliest drugs that we had, methylphenidate and amphetamines, are really relegated now to third line. We have more specific medications that have a much better safety profile. So uh, unfortunately, some, uh, many patients still need to take these, and many of you are probably on these, but uh, ideally, uh, we would like to see patients on the newer, more specific drugs for narcolepsy. So uh, how you might go about treating narcolepsy? Well, you might start with sodium oxabate, and what we're doing is we're entering a time of polypharmacy. Most patients with narcolepsy need more than one drug for narcolepsy. One just doesn't cut it. So that if a patient has uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, ideally you might add in solreamphetol with the oxabate, if the insurance will approve it. And of course this uh, uh, ignores the issue of trying to get insurance approval. If um, the patient still has some cataplexy despite being on oxabate, then um, you could add in patolicent, which is FDA approved for that. If they can't take uh, oxabate, which uh, unfortunately often occurs because it does interact with other medications, can't take it with alcohol, and in that case then you would go to patolicent as the first line drug, and it, uh, if that's not fully effective and the patient still has some sleepiness, you might add solreamphetol. Uh, if they still have some cataplexy, then you may add an uh, antidepressant medication. If you can't use either oxabate or patolicent, then you might go to solreamphetol if it's approved, and for the cataplexy, use the antidepressant. So, um, and then for idiopathic hypersomnia, the only drug that's FDA approved is oxabate, but the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, as I showed you earlier, did give a strong recommendation to modafinil, which is not approved for idiopathic hypersomnia, but that's the drug that they felt had the best evidence showing some efficacy in idiopathic hypersomnia. So in conclusion then, narcolepsy with cataplexy associated with uh, hypocretin loss. Uh, it seems to be an autoimmune disorder, maybe precipitated by an infection in most cases, uh, or the vaccine, uh, rarely. Uh, and oxabate is uh, probably the most effective medication that we have at the present time for narcolepsy. Uh, Patolicin's approved for excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy. So it's a good alternative to, to oxabate for patients taken during the day, uh, non-scheduled. And then alternative uh, treatments that would be at, oops, added on or used independently might be uh, solreamphetol, the modafinils, um, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors for the cataplexy. And then our future treatments are going to be uh, most interesting if the erexin agonists become available. It's still going to be several years away before that happens, but if they do become available, uh, as Dr. Mignot showed a little bit of data earlier on, uh, they can be extremely effective. But we don't know what they're going to do to nighttime sleep. Uh, we don't have evidence as to how, um, whether they'll improve nighttime sleep. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll stop at this point. And uh, if we have time, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> yes. You were mentioning the Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's called Wakex. Wakex is the trade name. Yes. This may be a dumb question, but why doesn't Big Pharma offer like $200 for volunteers to be in the studies? Is there a law against that? Well, I mean, they could easily afford it. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a great reluctance to actually give uh, patients money for participating in uh, clinical research studies because they feel that that 
is going to influence the way uh, people are going to get into studies and also uh, influence the results that they may give during the study. So there's a bit of reluctance. But despite that, some of the companies do offer quite a lot of benefits to patients involved in terms of travel assistance and meal allowances and, and other uh, assistance for people to get involved in studies. So uh, uh, there, may, there may be some companies, and I'm not exactly sure of all of them, that may give a very small stipend, but if so, it's really to cover expenses of being involved in the study rather than an actual payment for being in the study. Yes? You mentioned the onset of cataplexy and how it typically starts about six months after sleepiness or maybe you know up to two years later. How common is it for it to be years later after the start of symptoms? Because I've, yep. I've had narcolepsy symptoms since high school and I didn't develop cataplexy until I was 53. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. It can be many years later. So, uh, yeah, there can be a long course from the onset of sleepiness until the development of cataplexy. And this is why it's so important that clinicians, and some of you may get tired about the fact that every time you see a clinician, he asks you about cataplexy when you say you don't have it, because it can develop, and it's important to keep an eye out for that. Although, in terms of uh, treatment, the treatments are going to be the same if you do or don't have cataplexy. But from the insurance company point of view, it can make a difference because unfortunately the insurance companies may only approve certain drugs to people that have cataplexy and uh, so it may be harder to get those uh, drugs uh, if you don't have cataplexy. Right, yeah, and plus there's the, um, the issue of antidepressants and other medications uh, interfering with REM sleep and you know, just right. even being able to get a diagnosis in the first place. You know, having full-on narcolepsy but not being able to, to track it down is Well, that's right. I mean, there are challenge. many patients that have uh, come on uh, antidepressants because they may have had uh, depression or anxiety disorders from an early age and never know that they have cataplexy. And, and we see it so, sometimes uh, uh, with patients when we have them come off those medications in order to have the sleep studies to diagnose their narcolepsy. For the first time, they develop cataplexy and they never knew they had it. Thank you. I have a uh, question regarding cataplexy. Uh, I've had narcolepsy for going on 50 years, and my question, I understand how cataplexy creates a, a dysfunction when it comes to the neurological disconnect with muscle regarding muscle tone. Hmm. My question, though, is, can it actually affect cognitive, cognitive ability, though? Because I find when I'm in a stressful situation and I'm in a cataplectic state, it's like I, my brain doesn't yeah. function at all. Well, when you have cataplexy, cataplexy is a partial manifestation of REM sleep. So it's the weakness of REM sleep. And when a cataplectic episode goes long enough, patients can actually go into full-blown REM sleep. So they're actually going into sleep. So there is that sleep component to cataplexy which is going to affect cognitive function so being cognitively impaired at the time uh, of uh, cataplexy is not uncommon generally patients have enough awareness to know what's going on so they're generally not fully asleep but sometimes it can transition right into full-blown REM sleep oh, it's like trying to carry on a conversation and you can't because you can't put thoughts together right exactly mm -hmm. thank you yeah Thank you, doctor, for the excellent presentation. Um, you highlighted uh, that stimulants uh, are sometimes used but not recommended, and, or at least that's how I understood it, uh, like Adderall, and that it can lead to adverse psychological effects or psychosis. So I guess my question is a two-part, which is to the extent someone is already taking stimulants, how do you realize when you're at a tipping point where you know, the adverse effects are becoming more and more to the fore? And then, and then what's the process for getting off of it and getting onto something better? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, large numbers of patients with narcolepsy are on the stimulants, on amphetamines and methylphenidate. And because, you know, it wasn't too long ago, that was all we had available to us. So people who have had narcolepsy for a long time typically tend to be on those medications. 
I think what's happened is that we've transitioned now to more specific drugs and newer drugs for narcolepsy, and that's why the newer drugs we feel are more specific and better for patients and have a, um, a lower potential for adverse effects. I think the one area of concern with amphetamines and methylphenidate is the cardiovascular stimulation. Now we're learning more about patients with narcolepsy having a tendency for hypertension, high blood pressure, other cardiovascular disorders, so uh, they're more likely to be precipitated by traditional stimulants than they are by the newer medications. So certainly, uh, look, if there's any cardiovascular issue, then I would think a patient should try to avoid the uh, traditional stimulants as much as possible and move to something that is not going to exacerbate that. And is there a recommended process to transition? Because I'm imagining, you know, on day one, you know, you're taking it, and then on well, day two, you go cold turkey. Yeah, that's you, it's quite a bit difficult. The, the, the difficult thing is uh, traditional stimulants, let me just explain a little bit how they work. What they do is that they improve alertness, but then when they wear off, you get what's called a rebound hypersomnia. So what happens is as they wear off, patients get more sleepy, and sometimes more sleepy than they were before they took the drug, and then that sort of reinforces, well, yeah, I've got to be on this drug. I've got to take it again. And so they, they take it. So when it's time to come off the medication, it can be very difficult. The important thing, obviously, is it must be done slowly. Typically, it's done with a crossover where you're adding in a new medication and increasing the dose of that while you're gradually lowering the dose. But uh, it can be very difficult to get somebody off uh, for being on uh, traditional stimulants for many, many decades. It may be very difficult because, again, they get this rebound hypersomnia that, you know, they feel worse after they start to come off them and they have to take them, you know, take them. So it is difficult. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Hello. Oh, um, sorry, on this side. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, where do you... Where, you, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> um, question. Um, are Sunosi and Wakex approved for adolescents, older adolescents or only adults? And also, um, do they have side effects that worsen anxiety, depression? I mean, is there, what's the downside? Yeah, um, Sunosi, which is Solriamphetol, and Wakex, which is Patolicin, are both approved for adults and not approved for children as yet. Oxabate is. Oxabate's approved for children seven years and not up. So uh, Oxabate's the only one there. Uh, the traditional stimulants are actually approved in children because that goes way back and so they're approved in children. So very often clinicians will use the traditional stimulants in a child because uh, there there won't be any pushback from insurance whereas with the newer drugs there may be pushback because they're not approved. Right. And sorry, second part to your question? Second part was about whether they worsen anxiety. Oh, the, the symptoms. Yeah. Most medications that improve alertness work by stimulating the wake promoting neurons in the brain. That's uh, the dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, other chemicals in the brain. All of those can have a tendency, one, to increase cardiovascular parameters and secondly increase mental stimulation and so anyone who has irritability and anxiety and many patients with narcolepsy have that it they run the risk of uh, worsening that and that can happen with almost any of the alerting medications we have it's a little worse with the traditional stimulants than with the newer drugs and some of the newer drugs have a lesser tendency to do that but um, uh, there is that uh, problem with any sort of wake-promoting drug that's increasing alertness, it has a potential for increasing irritability, okay. anxiety, and, and even you tachycardia. To, and you need to be 18 to access that? Uh, yeah, you, you'd need to look at the exact cutoff in terms of age. Some specify 18, some sort of say in adults, and it may be very depending on the drug. Okay, yeah. thank you. But around there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you were uh, speaking about the onset of cataplexy. Uh, I had, I had uh, been told that as you age, it, uh, it cataplexy could be, get worse or better. Uh, what I've been told by uh, my sleep specialist is that around your thirties, it t 
tends to get worse. Uh, so I was diagnosed when I was 22, and around when I, I was I got put on disability in 2018. Uh, I'm 35 now, and it, it just doesn't seem to be getting better. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I see our time's up, so I'm going to answer, answer quickly, and then I'm very quick because yeah, I know you've been waiting. But uh, let me answer you. Uh, cataplexy uh, very often is worse at the beginning. People seem to notice it affects them most often at the beginning, and it's hard to know. Is it that they just learn how to handle it and to deal with it? That's why it seems to get better as they get older. But in most, but there's a lot of variability. For some patients, yes, it does get worse as time goes on. But for the majority, I'd say it's during those early years with cataplexy that it seems to be most problematic. Okay, quick question. Uh, in getting up into senior years, I would swear that the combination of aging and, uh, and all those factors uh, worsens the narcolepsy. There's really so. My question is: Is there any specific research into narcolepsy and in an older population? Yeah. Well, a lot of the studies that are done uh, uh, go up to about age 65. They often have a cutoff with the new drugs at age 65. But um, our feeling is that uh, it. Uh, Elderly patients obviously have far more comorbidities, other things going on as you get older, uh, cardiovascular disorders, renal disorders, and other things. So it gets a little bit tricky, and so one has to be careful about the choice of medication in the elderly patient. But there's no reason why an elderly patient can't be effectively treated with a, a combination of our newer drugs that we have. Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Doctor? Thank you. Yeah. I have one uh, question. I we got time for one more? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, this man just covered my first question, but have there been any, is there any correlation between vertigo and type 2 narcolepsy? No, uh, I'm not aware that there's been reported to be a, a direct association between the two, but certainly, um, you know, patients with type 2 narcolepsy and uh, just like patients with type 1 can have abnormal REM sleep phenomena. So people can experience uh, uh, sleep paralysis and sleep-related hallucinations and get pressure into REM sleep. And, and all of this can affect uh, coordination and, and may make somebody feel a bit dizzy. But specifically, vertigo, I'm not aware of a direct association with uh, narcolepsy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe.